sad day, one time, one day training horses. I mean, it was a terrible, terrible day. I had a three-year-old horse that uh, hadn't got into the show ring yet. He wasn't mean, but he had such a big motor in him. It's kind of like having a Volkswagen with a 454 blown Chevy engine in it. And I had rode him, I thought, to death. And so I came around the barn and stopped, and I just sat there. And next thing I knew, I was where the jaybirds fly. <laughs> he threw me up, and I could see over the pitch of the barn. That's how high it was. And when I came down, right on my bottom, and I put him up, and I still got a marble today on my hip where I hit. So I got a coat out, and standing in the cross ties uh, where I was, had him saddled and everything, and I reached up to touch him, and when I did, he jumped and he broke this finger and broke three toes on my right hand. <laughs> now here I am, bone leg, broke finger, three broke toes. So courageous as I am, I got him out and I rode him for, I don't know, three or four minutes up and down the hall, barn doors closed, the doors weighed over a hundred pounds a piece, sliding doors. And what happened, I don't know, but something spooked him and he left with me. And when I went past the cross ties, that didn't bother me because I knew the doors was closed and he would stop at that end. But about that far from the door, I knew the jig was up, but he wasn't going to stop. And he hit the door as hard as he could, knocked himself down, and I still on. Never would get off of one, so I just hooked him with a spur and clucked to him, and when he jumped up, he hit the doors again, pushed them straight out, and the door caught me right here, and drug all the way up and off the back of the horse, and here I was laying on the ground. And I got one of the boys to catch the horse, and I told him, I said, put him up, do whatever you want to. I've had all I can stand today to take any more. Now, the moral of this story is this. I went in the house, Barbara came in from work, I propped my foot in the chair, my toes black, throbbing. I said, Barbara, whatever you do, don't touch it. They are killing me, they are hurting, I had a bad day. Don't ever show Barbara anything that you've got hurt on. <laughs> bad deal. The next thing I knew, she sat down on me. <laughs> don't cough. She said, Damn, I'm <laughs> You know what you say that women never forget. I don't know what I've done, but she got me. <laughs> came back home to roost. That doesn't have anything to do with preaching. It has something to do with escaping. If you fall down and get back up. I refuse to give up. I refuse to roll over. I want to keep on going to the plant. What about you? I thank God that I'm looking at the green grass and still the root system. Amen. So we're ahead of the game. I'd like you to open your Bible's book of Galatians tonight. This is a great, great, great study that we that we've started. <coughs> uh, the amazing thing about Paul is, is that when he got saved, he completely made a 180. And he worked as hard for God as he worked against God. In fact, he didn't know what it was to ever waver, to quit, to back up. And most of the life that he spent, he spent either getting whipped or getting over a whipping or running from somebody going to kill him. And when they wasn't doing that, he is in jail. He had a hard life. But one thing you can say about Paul, he never wavered in what he believed. He never, he never got off course. Now the problem we saw last week, there was a problem in the church at Galatia. And so Paul writes to this church to get them back on the right track. Now what had happened is that there were some Jews that had got converted and they came to the church at Galatia which Paul had helped get established and preached and left somebody in charge of it. But when these Jews came in that had mixed law and grace together, they started teaching 
the people in the church at Galatia, you get saved by grace, but really the only way that you can really get grace and get into the church is that you got to get circumcised. So what they were doing, they were teaching grace along with law. Now, law in the Bible in the Old Testament, the law that God gave Moses on the mount was that so that we could distinguish between what's right and what's wrong. Until Moses received the law, man had no knowledge of what was sin. So God took and he gave all the commandments and he said, if you do this, this is wrong. If you do this, this is right. He gave a standard of laws. And so but the law came that it couldn't save you. It couldn't get you into heaven. But it was just to teach us what was right and wrong. So when Christ came, he came and he nailed the law to the tree. How do I say that? Why do I say that? Because in order to be saved under the law, you had to keep the law every moment, every second, all of your entire life, and never sin against the law, never break one commandment. Christ is the only one that ever did that because he was God made manifest in the flesh. When you looked at Jesus, you saw God 100% and you saw man 100%. It wasn't a 50-50 mixture. He was 100% God, 100% man. He kept the law and he nailed it to the tree. And this is where grace begins. And so in Galatia, they... They were happy with being saved by grace until this other group came along and said, yeah, but you got to get circumcised. So they started to add the law in. And last week we touched briefly. We're, we'll start at the 10th verse, but I'm going to just touch briefly what we studied last week. Paul said he was an apostle. He was not uh, made that of man. It didn't come by man, but it became by Jesus Christ. And he says it's what I've been teaching about grace is backed up by all the churches, is backed up by all the brethren that have been saved. And then he says uh, in the fourth verse who, that Christ gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from the present evil world. So he's teaching and telling by grace. And then in the sixth verse, he said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into grace of Christ into another gospel. So he said, I'm amazed that since you got saved by grace and you had such a good start by grace, that you are removed from it. You are removed from it. Trying to let something take its place. He said in two places, if a man preach any other gospel, this is in the eighth and ninth verses, if any, if any man preach unto you any gospel besides what I preached unto you, if it be an angel or if it be me, let him be accursed. And he thought, he thought that was so important, he said it twice. If anybody preaches anything but grace unto you, let him be accursed. There's only one way to heaven. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's only one way to be saved. Grace, grace, grace. There's only one thing that will keep you in, in the fellowship and the love of God. Grace, grace, grace. And all grace is is the unmerited love of God. I didn't deserve it. Neither did you. But we got it when we believed it. When we embraced it and accepted it. Alright, now that's what we talked about last week. In the 10th verse... There are th there's a threefold question that Paul is going to ask. For do I now please men? First thing. Paul said, am I preaching? And am I traveling? Am I being in prison? Am I suffering all the things I su I'm suffering just to please men? Or God? Now it didn't say please, did it? It said what? Persuade. Persuade. He said, am I going to prison? 
Am I being beaten? Am I suffering all these things to persuade men or God? Am I preaching grace, Jesus Christ, and Him crucified for the sins of the world to persuade God of that or to persuade men of that? Well, he certainly wasn't trying to persuade God of it, was he? Because this was God's plan. This was planned before the world even was formed. This was planned before Adam and Eve was made. It says that Christ was foreordained before the foundation of the world. So we know that. So he's not preaching and teaching this to persuade God, but it's to persuade men that they need to be saved by grace. Or do I seek to please me? Now, Paul certainly wasn't a man pleaser, was he? <laughs> Buddy, he made a blow jaw and poop slipped everywhere he went. Every place he preached, he called a spade a spade. He called black, black, white, white. It didn't make any difference who you were. He just preached Christ and him crucified for the sins of the world. You either accepted it or you rejected it. He didn't do it to, uh, to please men. He wasn't a man pleaser. And he goes on this far to say, For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Now I want you to think about this for a minute. If I only preach things that made you feel good, and the things that I preached never brought conviction, never was offensive to you, I would be seeking to be a man, please. I could keep everybody happy. I could keep everybody where that they just smiley, grinny, grinny, huggy, huggy, kissy, kissy all the time. But if I want to please God, I must preach the Word of God by the power of the Spirit of God, no matter who it touches. Now, friend, there are some times that I preach, I tear my hide off of myself. Believe it or believe it not, I do. There's times that I preach that, man, it gets so hard on me, I almost stop and go to the altar right there. You say, well, I didn't think it affected preachers that way. If they'll be honest with you, the reason is because we're human, flesh, blood, and bone. The same thing that bothers you bothers me. The burdens, the problems, the cares, the trials, the temptations, all these things that you suffer, the man of God suffers too. Uh, we're not put aside from it. So we're not men pleasers. 11th verse. But I certify. Now if you certify something, what do you do to it? What does it mean to be certified? It's true, it's pure. Okay. Anybody else? Assurance. Assurance. Somebody else? Genuine. Genuine. Reality. Anybody else? All these things are good. Certified. Uh, most of the things we buy here in America, if you get it home and you think you bought something made in America, flip it over. <laughs> it certifies it wasn't made in America. But some things that you get you say, I've got a Ford. It was made in America. Are you sure? Let me, let me, it wasn't. Some parts may have been, but some parts got made in Japan, China, Taiwan. <laughs> Why well, drive a Chevrolet? Are you sure? But Paul's saying, what I'm preaching to you and giving to you is the real thing. It has certification. Brother, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. Now that's a good thing. Right? It was not man-made. Now the most... <coughs> I don't know what the word is. What's the word for something that does not make sense? Ideological? Grace don't make any sense to me. 
It really don't. Because I feel, and everybody that I've talked to, we feel that we need to do something in order to get something. Well, from Genesis through the resurrection, through the day of Pentecost, people kept trying to do something to earn God's love and mercy and grace and forgiveness. But it never happened. And God knew, God knew from the beginning that we were sinful, wretched people that could not keep ourselves in line with Him. He knew that. So that's why grace came. It didn't come by man. Now, one of the classes that I took years ago, uh, it was a theology class, and it was talking about why religion came into existence. And this is what it, and after you did the whole class, this is what it said. In order to keep society in check, Man created as a figment of his imagination that there was a God and punishment for evil doing and there was a reward called heaven for those that did good and religion came about because man wanted to keep man in control. How's that sound to you? There's not much pumpkin, is it? That's what Paul's saying. I didn't get this for man. Now, it would have been easier for me if God had said in here, if you want to go to heaven, I'll tell you what you do. You make a hundred dollar down payment and make a payment of ten dollars a week for as long as you live and you can go to heaven. Now, I can understand that. I'm going to give this to get that. But God doesn't say that. Jesus said, I'm going to give this that you might have this. Forgiveness of sin, the Holy Spirit living in your life, and write your name in heaven that you can have eternal life. Now, he made it possible for a broke man to go to heaven and get forgiveness. He made it possible for a billionaire to get forgiveness and go to heaven. He made it possible for a paraplegic to get forgiveness and go to heaven. In fact, he made it possible for every living soul in this world. So that's beyond my comprehension. But I believe it and I accept it. It didn't come by man, is what Paul saying, 12th verse. Now, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, what does revelation mean? Made known. Made known. When revelation was written by John on the Isle of Patmos, revelation, John is a revealer. He opens up the doors. He opens the curtains. And things that's going to happen from now till the church is taken out, and what happens after the church is taken out? So Jesus is saying, I didn't get it from a man. Man didn't teach me this. But I got it by revelation. Now who's going to give a revelation? I could get up and tell you I can give a revelation. But that'd be a lie. In order to be a revelator, you've got to, you've got to be 100% spot on every time and everything that you predict. If you miss it one time, you're false. So there's only one that has been a revealer of everything, and that's God. So he, He's made known, He reveals it, and how did He get it revealed to him? It said, of Jesus Christ. Jesus, through the Spirit of God, revealed this personally to Paul. What's the first revelation that Paul received about Jesus Christ? I'm going to give you a hint. Road to Damascus. All right. First time that he had a revelation, God revealed himself unto him. 
Not only did he let him see the brightness of him, but he spoke to him. That's a revelation. And then he told him to go on to Damascus. Second thing God revealed unto him, he said, go to Damascus and I'm going to get you some help there. Three days, scales on his eyes, nothing to eat. Ananias came and laid his hands on him. He received his sight. Revelation. Then he went straightway and he began to preach. Revelation. He preached preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. 13th verse. For ye have heard of my uh, conversation in times past in the Jews' religion. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Now this is a good thing. Paul said, what have you heard about me? You know, you know that I took upon myself to persecute the church of Jesus Christ. I took upon myself to waste it. Now this was Paul's thinking. Paul was a Jew from the tribe of Benjamin and he was a uh, PhD in theology of Judaism. And he really thought that, the, that Jesus Christ and Christianity was as false as false could be. He believed that. And he took it upon himself. He's kind of like a wildfire. If he could get this thing stopped, stomped out before it got too big, it would be pleasing to God. In his mind, he really thought he was doing the will of God. Because he was under the law, he had been taught the law, but he didn't know about Jesus. So in that 11th verse, he said, You've heard of my uh, conversations time past in the Jewish religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, 14th verse, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equal in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my father. Now Paul thought that the Sabbath day was greater than the crucifixion. He thought not eating pork was greater than the crucifixion. He thought being circumcised was greater than the crucifixion. Why? Because all these things were under the law. And he had been educated under the law. And he thought within himself, in order for me to be right with God, I've got to hold to the traditions of the law. But yet Jesus had bled, died, buried, resurrected, and ascended into heaven the day of Pentecost. The church started. Thousands were being saved. So Paul said, man, I'm going to extinguish this thing. I'm going to stamp it out. I'm going to stop it. I'm going to put an end to it. <coughs> 15th verse. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace. Now when did it please God to call Paul? On the road to Damascus. Why did it please God to call him then? Now think for just a minute. He was a persecutor of the church. He tried to destroy the church. All the people, the Christians, they feared him. Now if God can take somebody that is a destroyer of what God is building and save him and turn him around, what kind of effect is he going to have on the children of God? What kind of effect is he going to have on the lost man? Now you can imagine Paul doing all this cussing, ratting and raving, throwing in jail and, and persecuting the church. And then here he comes out uh, after Ananias lays his hands on him and he gets baptized and he gets something to eat and he goes out and preaches Jesus Christ and him crucified for the sin of the world. Man, that's what he's talking about. Grace. If God can do that for me, is what Paul was saying. I preached the same thing that I got. 
I got saved and I preached the same thing to you and you got saved. Now if that's what saved you, that's what's going to keep you. And you don't have to add anything to it. It don't have to be mixed up. Now see, we have church. We like to have prayer. That's good. We like to have singing. That's good. We like to have preaching. That's good. But that's a mixture. All good things. And we feel in our hearts that they're necessary. But let me tell you this. There is not a mixture of anything to keep God's Spirit from working. We don't have to do certain things in order to get the Spirit of God worked up. We don't have to work Him up. Man, He got worked up a long time ago and He's never got over it. His job is seeking out those that are lost, convicting them of their sins, and calling them to repentance. We just get the blessing of praying with them. We just get the blessing of sharing the Word of God with them. We just get the blessing of saying, God loves you and I love you too. It's God that does all the work. It's God that did all the work before we were ever born over 2,000 years ago. All right, I get carried away on that. Uh, 15th verse or 16th verse. God called him by his grace, this is the reason, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Boy, that's a good word. Have you ever been called that? Yeah. I've been called that. I see one of the young men shaking his head, he's been called a heathen. I won't know a little. <laughs> 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 In fact, it hasn't been too awful long ago that somebody called me one. <laughs> we are heathen. You know why we're heathen? It's because we're Gentiles. We are heathen. If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. So we're all heathens. That's why God chose him, saved him, that he might go preach the gospel uh, to the heathens. <laughs> Now, he talks about in the 16th verse, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. All right, now, the next few verses are so important. When Paul got saved and called to preach, it said that he preached in Damascus. He went straightway into Damascus and he preached. <laughs> Now, I thought if you got called to preach, the first thing you needed to do is to go to college. Next thing I thought you needed to do is go to seminary. And then the next thing I thought you needed to do was, was to serve you an internship under a pastor as an associate pastor. <laughs> now, what made diff Paul different than everybody else? The difference was Man, he already had a Ph.D. in the Old Testament. He already knew the Old Testament from front to back. Peter, Matthew, James, John, they were fishermen. Do you know those four guys, they had a corporation? <coughs> they were fishing partners. They could tell you when to fish, where to fish, how deep to fish, what kind of bait to use, what kind of net, but they couldn't tell you how to get saved. And they couldn't tell you about King David, King Solomon. They couldn't tell you any of those things. Paul could. Because he was a vessel that God called out of due season after he called the apostles, after his death, burial, resurrection, after the church was established, then he called Paul. And Paul was already famous when he got called to preach. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Famous. But he wasn't famous for preaching the Word of God. He was famous for trying to kill the Word of God. Now God saves him. He said he didn't confer with man uh, or flesh and blood. 
17th verse. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. He said, well, after I got saved and called to preach, I didn't take a trip to Jerusalem. I didn't talk to any of the hierarchy. Peter, James, John, none of the apostles. Well, if he didn't talk to them, how did he know what to preach? He said he received it by revelation of Jesus Christ, right. by the Spirit of God. He knew the Old Testament, but now he understood the Old Testament. And he knew about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Now he understood the death, burial, and resurrection. So he began to preach the wonderful words of God. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to, uh, to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Man, he got as far away from Jerusalem as he could. Went to where the Arabs were. Preaching, teaching the word of God. 18th verse. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. Well, he got saved. He had been preaching. He went to Arabia, came back to Damascus, and he stayed there for three years. And then he went up to Jerusalem to have a little talk with Peter, Paul, Peter, James, and John, Matthew, and the other apostles. Now, the, the real thing is, that what he was preaching when he talked to the fellows in Jerusalem was identically the same thing. So he, he's telling the Galatians, listen boys, what you believe to get saved is the same thing that I've always preached. And these other guys have come in and tried to add the law to grace is just making you get all fouled up and you got confusion in your church. That's why the church must have one voice. Right. That's why that God sends and places a pastor. If every one of you came with a doctrine and stood on your feet and gave what you believe, how mixed up a bunch would this be? I mean, we would, we'd be wrestling in 15 minutes. We, just, we have the revelation of God. We have the Word of God. So the man of God, all he does is not give you his opinion, but he takes the Word of God and he expounds it. And through his expounding it, he explains it. And he's an opener and a revealer. The man of God has a gift. And the gift is that God calls him out and places on him the calling and the gift of preaching and teaching. Amen. Now there have been some folks that I've sat under and heard in my lifetime, I wondered where they got their calling. I'm being honest with you. I've heard some folks preach that when I walked out of that place, I said, I've said this to Barbara several years ago. What did he say? Did you understood anything he said? I know I'm not that dumb, Barbara. What book was he preaching from? I, I understood that he talked about a trip on a bus. And I ta understood that he talked about taking the youth to Six Flags. I got that. And I understood that they ate at McDonald's. I got that. And I understood that they stayed all night and they had pizza. I got that. And then we went away. <coughs> And I said, what was this all about? <laughs> I thought that when we went to church, we wanted to hear something from God. Right. Amen. I thought when we went to church, we wanted to worship the true and living God. Amen. We wanted to fellowship with our brothers and sisters. 
So here we went back. Now, we did that for two years. And this cat ain't never preached from this yet. Now, this is the thing. If you've ever sat under a preacher and teacher and you ever had the Word of God, there's nothing in this world that will ever satisfy you. If you come to church and you don't get something from God, there's something wrong with me or it's something wrong with you. You start with yourself and then get me. <laughs> now, he said he went back to, he went to Jerusalem for three years to see Peter and he stayed with him 15 days 19 first but others of the apostles saw I none save James the Lord's brother he said I saw Peter stayed with him 15 days I saw the Lord's brother James but he said I preached for three years before I ever talk to any of the apostles or any of those that were there on the day of Pentecost. Said, I didn't have, said everything that I got, I got by revelation of Christ. What I preach to you, you're saved by grace, you're kept by grace, you're given life by grace. I have not changed. 20th verse, Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. I don't know how they do it in court anymore, but when I was growing up, if you got called to the witness stand, you placed your left hand on the Bible, and you raised your right hand, and you, you swore that what you was going to tell was going to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. And as I understand, they don't do that anymore. You just promise to tell the truth. There's a difference in promising the trail of the truth and putting your hand on the book and saying, <coughs> if you do that, God might throw a lightning bolt on you. <laughs> you might be thinking that. So he said, I lie not. All the things that he's saying, I didn't get this from man. It didn't come from man. When God saved me, he called me to preach. I didn't go to Jerusalem. I didn't talk to Peter. I didn't do these things. Three years later, I went to Jerusalem. I talked, stayed with him 15 days. I'm telling you, boys, it's grace that saves you, and I'm not lying about that. We're going to finish this chapter. Afterwards, I came unto the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea which were in Christ. Now he said, these churches that I went to, not a one of them knew my face. Not a one of them knew what I looked like because they had never seen me. But I like what he says, says next. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in the times past now preaches the faith which once he destroyed. And they glorified God in me. Now, when Paul got there to all these regions that he went to, he preached in their churches. He preached the word by grace are you saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works, not by the law. Nobody can boast of salvation because it's of Christ. <coughs> and he said, I preach the same thing in every church. And he said, they glorify God in me. Now, what, what does that mean? It was saying, praise God for Paul is preaching truth. Paul is teaching truth. Thank you, God, for this man that persecuted the church and tried to stop it out. Thank you, God, for saving him and calling him to preach because we can see with our own eyes that, man, you've got grace. Somebody that persecuted and tried to destroy <coughs> now has become a blessing. <coughs> Boy, that's a good thing. 
We're going to stop there and we'll pick up the second chapter next week. This is just going to get better and better and better and better. But always remember this. If anybody ever tries to tell you you've got to do something else except believe and have faith in God to be saved, run as hard as you can right away from it. Because, folks, that is not grace. That's not the Bible. And the reason that I know is because I spent several years of my young Christian life and as a young preacher trying to mix law and grace. And the further I went, the worse I got. And my salvation turned from joy into a burden. And I said, man, if I, I got to do this in order to get to heaven, I will not do that now. But that's when I discovered about grace and his love. He did it all for me. And all he said is just believe it, accept it, and it's yours. And boy, I did. And I've been a different person ever since. It's made my life complete. Knowing that depending on me to get to heaven, I'm a faithful. But depending on Christ, it's a success. It will always be. Let's stand together.